Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Carol Hunter. Uh, I'm an associate professor here in SEAS, uh, teaching ecological design studio to landscape architects, as well as an interdisciplinary grad course in urban agriculture. Uh, my research is on how to design urban spaces for mental restoration. Today, it's my honor to introduce uh, Rebecca Mondrock, uh, Associate Professor in Art and Design. Today, she is going to tell us about the first egg out of the chicken anus. And okay, yeah, that got my attention, and I, and I had to know more about her. Uh, and in doing so, I discovered that uh, Rebecca studied painting and photography at Alfred University in New York and went on to get her MFA at Syracuse in photography. Uh, she became, because of this, fascinated by the way representation depends on who's behind the camera and how they use this power to portray. As a practicing artist and a writer, Rebecca uses humor and piercing insight to, ex to explore commerce, identity, and class and how those three weave together. For example, to explore this, I strongly urge anybody that has not seen Rethink Shinola uh, to take a look at that. It's on her website, which is her name, all one word, dot com. Uh, this is an artwork that was released a year ago, and I spent about an hour and a half today on the whole thing. I could not believe it. Uh, it's wonderful. Anyway, uh, this experience, again, is a perfect example how all of her work deals with this connection between commerce, identity, and art. So I don't know how we're going to get chicken anuses into that. <laughs> uh, when asked about her favorite food, she said, uh, this is such a great question, but so hard to give an answer because my favorite food in a realistic way is, as in, what do you want to eat tonight, would definitely choose Indian food. But then there's my favorite food in a not realistic way, as in, what one food would you eat if, if you could eat anything? And I would go back in time and eat my grandmother's pearl pearls. Thank you. That was so lovely. Um, thank you for having me here. This is such a fascinating evening. Um, well, I'll get to the food and the chicken's egg um, in a moment. But first, I want to paint a larger picture about the appropriation of working class values and acts of consumption, um, which is the basis of my research. This was an article in the New York Times in 2009 celebrating a new company, Best Made, which purchases axes, paints them, brands them, and resells them for $350. They call this the Urban Axe, um, or the Designer Axe. While an ordinary axe might, might cost $20 to $40, the best made American felling axe is no ordinary axe. You can tell how special this axe is because it has a sticker, a sheath, diagrams, and signage. It's, it's branded, named, and has a story created for it that usually involves guys camping, references to the history of men in power, and manly encounters with wild beasts. <laughs> the axe has been elevated from the ordinary so that wealthy men in New York City can hang it on their mantle place, where they make sure the axe is never scratched, and they show off their connection with manual labor. There are several problems with this appropriation. The first is that manual labor was, historically, disdained by the upper classes. Physical work was the one action that seemingly had to be earned and couldn't be purchased. Jobs involving manual labor aren't done for an hour for fun on the weekend. They're done even when your body resists doing them. Labor shouldn't become a prop for luxury consumption. <laughs> There's a kind of arms race for meaning and status that suggests we look to external factors for meaning. And when these are proved to be meaningless, we search increasing, for increasingly rarefied objects. In the process, we devalue the humble objects in front of us that do have real meaning. It's easy to shift our examples to the world of food. We could look at the menu of this local restaurant serving, quote, food of, sub, of substance, unquote. Everything on the menu is delicious, um, I'm sure. But the language reinforces this idea of prosperity, specialness, and the acquisition of the ordinary. For example, the salad has not croutons, but hand-torn croutons. 
There is someone in the kitchen actually hand tearing each of those croutons. <laughs> the crouton was just a thrifty way to use stale bread. It was never meant to be precious. But here, this food with humble and resourceful origins is elevated for profit and status. The hand-torn crouton is the equivalent of the hand-painted axe. <laughs> Chef and writer Tunde Wei wrote a great article about restaurants and power in Detroit, but it's applicable everywhere. He wrote, quote, serving locally forged produce and ingredients, restaurants are weaponized and deployed to promote a very specific, circumscribed, and white aesthetic. These efforts often pretend to prioritize equitable development over speculation and profiteering by adopting the slang of inclusion and diversity. But because they tend to define community and food in racially and economically inclusionistic terms, they continue and maintain the same tradition of segregation. A pretty well-known example of this from New York centers on the chopped cheese made of ground beef with onions topped with melted cheese on a hero roll. Bodegas in East Harlem sell the chopped cheese for four or five dollars. The sandwich was said to have originated years ago in Haji's Deli in East Harlem. In 2016, a white reporter from Insider Magazine went to the deli, tried a chopped cheese, and wrote a story about it, calling it, quote, a steal at four dollars, unquote. So by missing the point that for Haji's customers, $4 is their budget to spend on a sandwich and not a steal. The reporter also exclaimed enthusiastically and erroneously that, quote, most New Yorkers don't know about it, unquote. And we get to back to Whole Foods again. Um, pretty quickly, Whole Foods in New York was selling their version of a chopped cheese for $8. Then White Gold, a bougie new butcher shop in the Upper West Side, started selling their version for $15. This Columbusine of the chopped cheese purports to discover something that's existed for generations and recast it in the eyes of the colonizer as exotic. To revisit our local menu, another item that accompanies the hand-torn crouton is the pullet egg. When I encountered this, I was uninitiated in the specialness of poultry product and had to ask what a pullet egg was. Their front of house team member told me, quote, it's the first egg a chicken ever lays. <laughs> I thought he was joking. <laughs> and I pictured a whole room full of chickens handing over their first egg <laughs> proudly. I've since come to discover that a pullet chicken is a chicken that's under one year old. A pullet egg is an egg from that chicken. But there are varying specialnesses of pullet egg, and the one that comes out first is the most special. I use this example to call attention to the language of specialness that often surrounds food and the frequent attempts by the affluent to distinguish ourselves by pursuing ever more rarefied means of consumption. Thank you.